Well, it's Monday again already. Wow, these weeks are just rolling by so fast, aren't they? Wow, tonight's story has a moral. <laughs> yes, it does. And the moral of tonight's story is, be careful what you wish for. Now, if I say anything more than that, I'd be giving too much away. And I'd hate to do that without you bothering to listen to the story first. Now, if you missed last Friday's story, go back and check it out. Two whole hours for you. Ooh, I gave you a chance over the weekend to listen to it, but it's still there, of course, and I'll link to it at the end of tonight's video. Well, you know what time it is. It's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink. And listen. It was raining that day when I heard my doorbell ring. What can I do for you, sir? I asked the tall, well-dressed man, grinning ear to ear on the other side of my front screen door. First, may I come in? He asked as the rain began to pour harder. Please, I just got this dry cleaned. He gestured at his already soaked grey suit. Sighing, I opened the door. I couldn't let such a fine suit be ruined in the rain. It'd be a pity to let the money go to waste for dry cleaning. The well-dressed man in his suit almost pushed me as he rushed into the house, allowing drops of water to spray onto the beige carpet below. Mm, lovely place you have here. You live here with your boyfriend, miss, he spoke as he made himself, still drenched, mind you, comfortable on my newly bought sofa, with his legs spread wide open like a hall in an Amsterdam brothel. For a salesman, I found him to be the most bold I'd ever encountered. Clearing my throat before I answered him. No, I live alone. <laughs> oh, how embarrassing. No man of your own for such a lovely lady as yourself. I shrugged off his unnecessary question and went right into it. What is your business? Ah, oh, that. How rude of me not to introduce myself. Call me Mr. Salesman, he said, then bowing like a gentleman once he got up from the sofa. As he bowed, I noticed that there was no damp spot where he'd sat. In fact, all evidence that he'd been in the rain was gone. The carpet wasn't wet and his suit was as dry as an old woman's private parts. He must have noticed I was alarmed at this, because he said, oh, Not to worry, madam. My suit is made of the finest thread. Soaks water up like a sponge. Hmm, I see, I said, stepping away. So, uh, Mr. Salesman, what do you want? I want to help you. Help me? Sorry, sir, but I'm fine. Exactly, miss. You're fine, but fine isn't good. And good isn't great. What you need, and so well deserve is something better. Something? I felt his breath as he whispered in my ear. Exquisite. Panicked, I jumped from him, making myself as far away as possible as I leaned back against my window. How did he get next to me so fast? Please, I panted. Don't do that again, sir. Or I'm throwing you out in the... I turned to point out the pouring skies but found myself looking at a clear, sunny sky. Huh, I breathed as I stared in disbelief. I'm going to get some lemon. I turned to see the man holding two fucking glasses of lemonade in his hands, smiling at me as if he was offering the keys to paradise. A uh, lemonade? He asked before laughing. <laughs> Want some? It's made from the finest of lemons. The Bahamas, I think. He took a sip from his glass. Uh, no, Florida. Still good, though. What in the ever-living fuck? I thought aloud as I accepted my drink. Ah, please take a seat. Defeated at trying to make sense of things on my own, I sat down in my armchair as I sipped my drink to find a hint of vodka in it. This made me down the drink faster than a recovering alcoholic drinking vodka for the first time. The odd man in my living room began explaining. Hmm, as you have already noticed, 
Things are not what they should be around you. In the past few minutes, you've seen things that defied the very rules of science humanity has ruled out. For instance, it was pouring a moment ago. It stopped in merely an instant the moment your eyes glanced away. Then, there's the fact my suit is dry, along with your furniture and floor. And now, you drank something I gave you just for desiring it moments ago. Certainly, something is happening. And my dear, don't fret, because you aren't going insane. It's just that things in this world can be... <laughs> manipulated by the right things, so to speak. My head was now spinning from trying to comprehend what I was being told, or from the alcohol. Either way, the denial of my reality began to seep through me as I rambled. I must be dreaming this. You, you aren't real. Nothing about this should be real. He shook his head and he susked disapprovingly, as if I were a child with an active imagination that blamed a creepy doll for spilling his juice. Oh, Miss Evans. He now sat on the coffee table in order to sit in front of me, gazing into my eyes as he spoke. You know better than that. Someone like you, who has studied the sciences, should not deny any evidence to what's real, despite what they believe to be true. It goes against everything scientific you've studied, doesn't it? I was stunned the moment he called me by my maiden name. A sense of fear shortly crept up my spine. As his eyes held mine, it felt as though he was looking deeper, penetrating my subconscious mind and unlocking what I'd forgotten or hidden. Quickly, I retreated my hands and averted my gaze. How did you know my name? Ah, I know all my potential clients, Ms. Evans. I'm currently learning more about you as I speak. I'm learning that you didn't used to live alone. I know it was a man who lived with you, quite dear to you. I also know of how depressed you've been because of his departure from what emotions have been expressed that remain in this room. Oh, the intense gloom I feel is almost suffocating. So very suffocating. I felt it from a mile away and followed it. Because that's what I do. That's why I'm here. Who are you? I asked. My voice was now trembling. I told you, Miss Evans, he claimed. I'm Mr. Salesman. I, I think you should go, I said, calling bullshit. He sighed disappointedly as he got up and headed for the door. Ah, I guess you won't get to see your husband again. Oh, what a shame. I bet he's dying to see you, he taunted, as his fingers wrapped around the door handle. Falling for the taunt, I responded weakly. What? Let's see. What was his name? Ricky. No. I can see Nicky. Ah, Nicky. Well, yes. But you've dismissed me, he said as he opened the door. Now, excuse me, as I must. In my drunken, vulnerable state, I rushed to him and forced the door shut. No, no, stay, I begged. Please. Mr. Salesman smiled. Please. We soon found ourselves sitting at my dining room table across from each other. I gazed nervously at my fingers as I waited for Mr. Salesman to speak. The sound of paper sliding across the surface of the dining table broke the silence, causing my gaze to rise to see an unsigned contract and quill before me. Sir, how do you expect me to sign this with just a quill? I questioned. Still grinning, he spoke. I'll get to that in a moment. Before that, may I have your left hand? His left hand reached between us waiting for mine as his beckoning gaze captivated mine. Almost instantly, without a second, my hand lay gently on his with my palm upward. With his index finger, he sliced my palm open with his nail, creating a diagonal cut. I gasped in response, as I expected pain, but it was met with a tingling sensation. My whole hand was numb from what I'd later assume was an anaesthetic. Without a word, he tilted my hand. Blood trickled down into an empty ink bottle, 
which I swear wasn't there before, but at this point, I didn't care. In all the events that followed after, and would follow after the drinks appeared, logic was no longer present. Because of this man, whoever or whatever he was, the only factor I'd come to know to defy the laws of any and every science. In a sense, my brain was numb as well as intoxicated. It was as if I was high on the strongest psychedelics. I no longer saw the point in focusing on how or why, because all my mind was focused on was, when will I see my Nikki again? Only later would I come to realize I was under extreme hypnosis by just looking into his eyes. My mind swirled as thoughts of my dead husband rushed in. It didn't take long for me to sign the contract with my own blood. A contract I desperately wished I'd read before signing. The moment I put the quill down on the table, I fell into a deep, dreamless sleep. When I woke up the next day, I conjured up all that had happened the previous day and thought it was just a dream. Until I saw my dead husband making us the usual breakfast he'd done when he was still alive. Obviously startled, I stared at him in disbelief. There, my husband, who had been dead for five years, was standing, making scrambled eggs. I must have gasped, because he quickly looked in my direction. Everything okay, love? You look like you've seen a ghost. Hearing him speak almost moved me to tears. I'd forgotten what his voice sounded like. God, I had missed him. I blinked the tears away as I quivered out. <laughs> yes, I swallowed. You just make me so happy, Nicky. He laughed. <laughs> All right then, weirdo. Food's almost done. I sniffled as I sat down. Don't you have work? Work? He said as he set down a plate of scrambled eggs before me. I haven't been employed for five years. Oh, I said confused. Don't we have an issue with money? He came to sit adjacent to me, wearing a face of extreme concern. The back of his hand rested gently against my forehead. Then he spoke. No, of, of course not. Sweetheart, are you feeling well? Never felt better, I said, honestly. When did we pay off the debt? Um, your father did, five years ago. I scoffed. <laughs> my mother was okay with that. Uh, sweetheart, don't you remember? Remember what? I said, absolutely confused. Uh, the hospital. What are you talking about? I asked, feeling myself getting nauseous by the second. Uh, the accident? My eyes welled up in tears, remembering how drunk we were when we decided who was more able to drive that night. I shook my head as if to shake the memory away as I whimpered. Oh, please, no. Yet the flashes of that traumatic day came flooding back. Red ambulance lights flashed in my vision as I lay heaving on the cold, wet concrete. I heard a man's voice in a calm tone say, Ah, it'll be all right, Miss Evans, before losing consciousness. I woke to see my mum standing over me, holding my hand as streams of wet mascara streamed down her face. You're awake, she said. Can I see Nicky? I faintly remembered saying, before my mum wrote down in front of me. And then I knew he was gone. Then unfamiliar flashes replaced the old ones. One by one, I no longer saw us crashing. I no longer saw myself in a hospital bed screaming for my husband. I no longer stood by his casket with my family by my side at the wake. No more weekly visits to his grave or therapy sessions about him with my therapist Elizabeth. Instead, I remember receiving a call five years ago. So, vividly, it felt like it was currently happening. Mrs. Yates, a young woman's voice could be heard. I spoke, tiredly. This is the Yates residence, Emily speaking. This is Miranda at Mercy's Medical Hospital. Edward Conwell is at the desk wishing to speak with you. Let me speak to him. I interrupted, almost immediately, becoming alert and aware of the urgency of this phone call. My brother-in-law spoke calmly on the other end, with what I guessed was muffled crying in the background. Em, I have some bad news. You might want to sit down. I sat down on my bed as I felt my husband behind me sitting up. 
My stomach churned as I tried to prepare myself for what was to come. Em, you should come as quick as you can. Lauren is here with me. She's okay, but... He sighed. It's your parents, Em. I twisted the telephone cord in my hand as I felt myself tremble. What about my parents, Ed? He blurted. They were in a car accident. I found myself up now, standing as I yelled. Are they okay? Your dad is in a critical condition. I asked, weakly, And mum? I held my breath, waiting for his response. Is my mum okay, Ed? I repeated, angrily. Ed inhaled before speaking. No, Em. She's gone. No. I heard myself saying as I dropped the phone. My husband rushed to my side before picking up the phone as I sobbed. Later, at the hospital, I was told my father would survive, but my mother had died on impact. I sat next to my father as I cried quietly while he rested in his bed. My mother's wake was the following Monday, and the funeral came a day after. Family, friends, and co-workers came and attended both services. The flash of unfamiliar memories didn't stop there, though. Oh, no. It got much worse. On the anniversary of my mother's death, I found my father's lifeless body on the floor of his study, with an empty bottle of pills inches from his open hand. In the span of the next few years, the rest of my family members would die until I was the only one left of the Evans family. During the first year, Lauren, my sister, and her two children would be killed as her home caught fire in an explosion due to a gas leak and faulty wiring. Edward came to stay at my home for a few months after, until he fled the country, fleeing from his past to hopefully start again somewhere else. I'd come to grieve the end of our friendship. The next to go, a year and six months after my sister's death, which was expected but still made me grieve, was my grandfather, Francis. After three years of being diagnosed with stage 4 lung cancer, Francis died at the age of 87. Luckily for his wife, she was not related to me, and she lived. And no one died. But a week after, a two-year peace period, my uncle, his bitchy wife, who I shed no tears for, and my beloved cousin, Angela, died as their plane exploded as they took off for Paris. Apparently seven people who were going on that plane got off and were spared, but most of them would die later because, obviously, death is a real asshole. The last relative to go was my younger, mentally deranged cousin, who had killed my aunt and uncle long before this shit went down. However fucked up he was, I still couldn't hate him for having untreated schizophrenia, which my uncle, Tim, believed could be cured by nature's medicine or psychedelics. Tim died an idiot, and also high, along with his wife. Unfortunately for my cousin, he was sentenced to a whole life in a mental institution instead of being properly medicated with the right meds until he was diagnosed with the right disorder. However, the damage was done, and he had become an absolute madman by the age of 20. He wasn't dangerous anymore, but his thoughts and belief were batshit insane. He claimed his name was a man from the future, Kevin Narwhal. <laughs> yes, the animal, who needed to get back to the future to take care of his hamster, Mort. His name was Dave, and he was deathly allergic to hamsters. Dave died from asphyxiation at the age of 28. My husband shook me back to reality as I found myself rocking back and forth, sobbing into him as he comforted me. The next several years were much harder than the last as I grew to cope with the tragedy, trauma and grief that I had. Nightmares and sleepless nights came to be my reality. Most of these nightmares were about that damned Mr. Salesman in my dreams. Oh! Look what you've done, he'd say between fits of laughter. As the nightmares went on, I soon saw that fucker everywhere. At first, I thought it was just due to hallucinations from trauma or lack of sleep, until I was prescribed with medicine. No meds could make Mr. Salesman go away, and that's how I knew he was as real as I was. It wasn't until I was pregnant with my first child that I stopped seeing that man who'd haunted me for years. My mental state improved as the months passed. Therapy sessions reduced from three times a week to two, then twice a week to once a week. 
That once a week became every other week, until I stopped going altogether. In my last weeks of pregnancy, I was finally at peace. The day came when my waters broke. My husband drove me to the hospital, where I'd spend the next several hours experiencing pains unlike I'd ever known before. The birth came. It felt like an eternity pushing a child out of my body. But the joy and relief when you finally hear the sound of your child crying makes all the pain worth it. Immediately, I wanted to see my child, but something had gone wrong. The sound of my child crying stopped, along with my breathing, as I saw the hospital staff haul my beautiful baby boy away from me. Where are they taking my baby? I cried. My husband was yelling at the staff as he followed them out in the hall. He came shortly to my side, sweating. Where is he? He squeezed my hand as he spoke, reassuringly. In the emergency room. I started to sob in. Sweetheart, he choked out, trying to stay strong, but I could tell that his own heart was breaking. Please don't cry. I can't lose my son. He hushed me as we held each other. Eventually, I passed out from how exhausted I was. When I woke, my husband was walking around with our child wrapped in his hand. A wave of relief and happiness swept through me. I smiled as I sat up, watching my Nikki swaying our child. His grin widened when he saw that I was awake. <laughs> Mommy's awake, Johnny, he cooed. You want to see Mommy? Has he been awake for long? I asked my husband, with my arms ready to finally hold my child. For a bit, yeah, he answered, taking his way over. Maybe you can get him to sleep. Nicky carefully handed me the newborn, while cooing. Hey, here's your mommy. My joy fled. As dread came the moment my son and I looked into each other's eyes. Staring back at me were the same cold, dark eyes that had haunted me these many years. Thanks for taking the time to drop by and watch this video. You know what would make me a happy doctor? Hitting that like button, leaving a comment, and subscribing to my channel. Go on, I've got plenty more stories to tell you. <laughs>